Ryan, we would not put the light switch at your height so you could have light switch raves. Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. How you doing? It's the season finale. Yes. And today we have a very, very special topic. And that topic is engagement. Yes. It is a thing that people do all the time, especially, I don't know, um, when they're in love and when they want to do things and hang out together for the rest of their lives. And I'm really not super expert on it. But we figured it would be a cool thing to talk about for our last show of 2016. Mm-hmm. So icebreaker, Ryan, where's the icebreaker? Oh, um, best proposal story. Yes. Okay. So Jim, what is your best proposal story? So, so my best proposal story. I am not married, um, nor have I ever been. Um, but I have been part of some proposals, and I have read about them a lot, and seen them in movies, and do you know the kinds of things you always do. Um, and the best proposal I ever read. Uh, was actually in Sandman Mystery Theater by Matt Wagner. Uh, It was like this, I think it was like 60 or so issues. I'll throw a link in the show notes because it's great. The covers are gorgeous. Dave McKean did the covers and they're incredible. It's all like this weird, cool photography collage stuff. And um, there's a minor character in Sandman who, if I'd been clever, I would have spent the pre-show looking up his name. (laughs) Um, this is now. This is not Neil Gaiman Sandman. This is Sandman like DC Universe. Um, runs around with a sleep gas gun. Sandman. I think so, he was in uh, the Justice Society. right? He was in the Justice Society. That's correct. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a bunch of really cool JSA comics about that too, but that's for another time. So there was this cop, and he was an asshole. He was an asshole to everybody. Um, he was like like not in the sense of being like mean. Or vindictive, but in the sense that, like, being a police officer, being a detective is the only thing he's good at. And he's very good at it. But it's the only thing he can do well. Mm. And everything else, you just he's just kind of super shit at it. Like, and, and that includes being a general human being. So, about midway through the series, uh, you know, somebody comes back into town and they're like, Oh, my, my sister's in town, we should all have dinner together, and they do. And then periodically you start seeing him, like, having dinner like with this lady's sister. Like, it just sort of... And, and, and this is set in, like, the, the I want to say late 30s. Mid to late 30s, yeah. Because the, the final plot line has to do with uh, the beginning of World War II and fifth columnist Nazi sympathizers. Now, it, this, this lady's sister sort of... Whose, whose name I also do not remember... Because um, she is in that comic even less. Um, she mostly serves to contextualize this police officer. You know, she gives him a thing to run out on when, when he gets his hot tip in the middle of the night. Mm. Um, you know, and it's like dinner or lunch or drinks or whatever. And just, just, just constantly just... He's always, he's always running off to do his thing that he's good at. Um, and you get the impression that like he's, he's just... He's just awful at being around other humans. Until the last... The last story... Um, and the arcs, are, the arcs are really definitive. God, this is such a good series. Um, like, I want to go back and read it. <laughs> but uh, in the last story... He gets he gets his tip... And, it, and, and like it's, it's the bombshell one. He's like, what do you mean... Um, also forgot Sandman's name. Just just A plus <laughs> on this story. But and, you know, and, he, and he's running out of the, the police station, and he runs past that woman, and she's she she sort of stops. She's like, "We were gonna go and get lunch," and he's like, "Oh yeah, we were gonna get lunch. We, that was a thing we were gonna do." But I, I really have to. And he just sort of like pauses for a minute, and he's like. We, we, we get lunch. We, we have lunch all the time. We can... Do you want to get married or what? And, and I remember reading that line and being like, that is the most romantic thing ever. Like, that is just... The notion that it's just that simple. Where, you know, like, because like movies make it out to be this huge elaborate thing. And we're going to talk about engagement sort of in this podcast. But, but and he's just like, no, like, this is the simplest thing ever. 
and I really have to go and take care of this other thing. But let's just, just... Listen, if you want to get married, just be here when I come back. <laughs> and we'll just go do it. <laughs> and it's, it was just sort of... Like, like, of course he was bad at it, because he's bad at everything about this. But he was at least honest in his feelings. And I appreciate that uh, in a weird sort of way. Anyway, Huck, what's your best proposal story? Um, is it from comic books? No, it is not from comic books. Not from movies, not from books or anything like that. It is my proposal. I, what? Yeah, I, I like... As of recording, a week ago from from today, proposed to my now fiancé, which I'm still getting used to that word, fiancé. Mm. Uh, or fiancé, I usually call her. Fiancé. Kind of like, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I just like no. being weird No, way. we're not doing that. No. It's okay, I call milestones millistone. Oh my god. <laughs> but anyways, I got, yeah, I my... so much, why do I do a show with you? <laughs> Because I'm cute or something like that. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah. Totally I, stupid story. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I got uh, engaged. Or I proposed last week, I guess. Maybe I didn't get engaged. I don't know what the semantics are on that one. But, um, yeah. So, it was originally supposed to be my Dirty 30 birthday weekend. Uh, and we decided to go away uh, because I don't like parties. And I don't, <laughs> I don't like uh, making things about me. And I saw it as a... Well, originally I had pr- genuinely proposed that we go away for the weekend. And then I kind of collected my thoughts and like, this would be the perfect time to do it. I feel like you're like, I propose that we go to the... <gasps> oh my god! You know what? It wouldn't surprise me if I did do something like that. But um, no, it was like... We had been talking about it loosely as a concept for a while. And we were getting... We were both feeling that it was kind of coming... Um, but the problem was, is when you start to talk about it openly and you're both favorable towards it, then you get into the problem of having to make it a surprise and make it so that the person you're asking is not aware of it going to be happening, which is why I decided to do it when we went to Michigan last week. I'm like, if we're going for my dirty 30 party, there is almost no way that she's going to see it coming or she sees it coming, which is just another perfect reason why I want to marry her because she's far more clever than I ever, <laughs> I'm ever going to be. Um, so we decided to go to Michigan. We went to, uh, Frankenmuth because that was Frankenmuth and Birch Run where, where we went for our one year anniversary four years ago, basically this month, actually, as of filming today would have been the five year anniversary of when we first started dating. So romantic. So romantic. Um, so we did it there. Frankenmuth is like a little German Christmas town. So we went to Bronner's. Link to Frankenmuth in the uh, show notes because yeah. it's, it's a weird ass cool place. It's it's definitely interesting. We went to Bronner's, the Christmas store, apparently the largest Christmas store in the world. Although what I don't know, mean? I don't know how you measure that, but I'm not going to argue against them. In wreaths per square inch. Maybe I don't know. So we went ornament shopping, um, and then we uh, we went to this little Bavarian inn uh, for dinner and stood in line for forty five minutes just to get seated because neither of us thought, hey, during the peak Christmas season, maybe we should make a reservation in literal Christmas town. In yeah. literal Christmas town. So we waited forty five minutes, and then um, my original plan was to do a horse ride carriage and ask her on the carriage so that we would be segregated and it'd be kind of romantic but so we went to stand in line because there's a line because it's peak christmas season and i didn't think to make a reservation although apparently you can make reservations for stuff like that Hmm. makes sense and it's actually cheaper to make a reservation than it is to stand in line or at least they implied that they said there's a reservation and reservation fees you have to make a reservation to get the reservation fee Mm -hmm. i'm assuming it was discounted but it could very well not be so we're standing in line it's cold it's coming up at 8 o'clock at night, and Sarah's like, you know, like maybe like maybe we should just not do this, um, because we didn't want to wait in line, mm-hmm. and Sarah actually doesn't really like horses. They kind of freak her out. <laughs> so she's like, why don't we just like go somewhere else or go back to the hotel, and and I, I there was a couple other things that I wanted to do. I wanted We wanted to buy fudge. We wanted to go to the cheese house and buy some cheese. Uh, and also, I don't like going to Michigan without buying craft beer because they have a fantastic selection. 
Mm-hmm. So um, we went to the little mill, uh, which is like a, I, th- I think they brew beer there, but at the very least in their storefront, they have a this giant walk-in fridge with uh, with beer, like uh, craft beers, all different kinds of craft beers. Unfortunately, they had closed like two minutes before we walked up the stairs to go into the store. So that kind of sucked. So we skipped that, uh, went to the f- one of the fudge places to buy some fudge, uh, found out where we could go buy beer at this time of night. Um, then we went to Cheese House and it was far too busy. And meanwhile, the entire time, so keep in mind, my plan was to propose on a horse ride mm-hmm. that we're not on a horse ride now. So the entire time... So Cheese House is not on a horse. Cheese, cheese House okay, is I'm not following. on a horse. I'm following. But the problem is, is now I, I don't... I, so I didn't have a plan of what I was going to say. I figured I'd just make it up as I was going. Now I didn't even have a plan to do what to do. So I had to run an audible. So the entire time I'm scanning, <laughs> I'm scanning the city streets looking for the, a place to, to pop the question. Just couldn't like I'm walking up and down the street and, and we we finished at the cheese house and you know Sarah's been tired and she wants to go back to the hotel kind of deal because uh, I mean Bronner's takes a lot out of you like the the parking lot alone trying to find a parking spot at that place then navigating through all of the throngs of people and then just like it's you're, you're drained by this we want to go back to the hotel. And so I said, well, wait, there's like this cup, there's like this bridge over there with some lights on it. Like, why don't we, why don't we walk off dinner and keep going? And Sarah's like, <laughs> okay. So. Gotta get my step count. Yeah. So put the, put the, the fudge in the car and we went, we went over this bridge, really beautiful bridge with lights on it. And the bridge leads you into this kind of like Bavarian village looking area. Um, all the houses in the, the you know the, the cobble streets and stuff, and all the houses are all storefronts. So we're going through the different stores, you know, Cherry Republic and a few others. And we come up to the city square, and it's uh, a large uh, fake Christmas tree, and there's a couple like patio chairs there. I'm like, oh, let's let's sit, sit down and look at the Christmas tree. She's like, okay. She's been a good sport the entire time, which is amazing. <laughs> so we sit there, and we're kind of sitting there, and uh, and I'm like, yeah, like ah, oh, yeah, it's like really pretty and stuff. Because, you know, that's uh, unromantic that way. I'm like, you know, like, we're kind of like an old couple. You know, let's just sit here and stuff. She's like, yeah. Wandering aimlessly through the streets, not remembering each other's names. Yes. Yeah. This is what we're like. And and so, like, and there's people still milling about because it's about 9 o'clock at night. And I'm, I'm waiting for a mm. break in the people. Like, wow, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? And uh, and then so she comments. She's like, your hand's really cold. Which, of course, I'm nervous, so, like, my hand, like, all, all the blood's been shunted from the extremities, trying to process what the hell I'm going to do. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, I'm just going to warm up my hand in my pockets. So I put it inside my coat pocket where the ring is, uh, in, the, in the box. And so I start playing with the box, and, like, trying to think of what I'm going to say. And then I'm like, well, I need to figure out what side of the box opens, because I want to pull it out and smoothly open it. Yeah, you don't want it, you don't want one of those moments where you're, like, open the box facing yourself, and you're like, oh... I accept. Yeah. Put the ring on. Walk away. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm playing with the box, and and I can't thumb the side that's open. Like I, for whatever reason, none of the sides are lifting. I'm like, and I can feel a, a section where the uh, the top and the bottom lips are kind of misaligned. I'm like, did I sit on the box and break the hinge? Like, what what did I do? What am I doing wrong? So then I try to covertly, so I've got my right hand in my pocket, and I covertly reach my left hand over, and I start... No one can see your hands right yeah. now. You're going to need to lift them up. Yeah, there we go, for those watching the video. And I'm, like, playing with the box, trying to, like, figure out which side it's open. For of those course, listening, Huck is describing everything that he's doing. Welcome to ASMR. Yeah. And uh, it's just, and obviously this is trying to be covert, and so I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> for those listening, it's super sneaky. Yeah. And, and... Uh, so she's what are you doing? And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, like, and she's like, what, you got a monster in your pocket? And I'm like, yeah, I got some in my pocket. And she, like, laughs. But then she realizes that I'm not laughing. And she's like, she's like, what, what do you got in your pocket? My DS. Yeah. And at this point, at this point in my mind, it's like, okay, it's go time. There's no possible way I can walk this back because all throughout the day she's been like are you okay you know so because I've been thinking about it all day and for the most part I was able to pass it off you know like ah you know I'm, I'm tired because I'd worked at the bar the night before and so like we woke up early to leave for for Michigan so like I'm tired or I'm hungry or whatever there's no way I can walk this back I'm like I can't I, I can't walk this back it's go time so so she looks at me and then so I pull I, I start pulling my hand out of the pocket and I slide off the chair into my my knee because like, you got to do it on one knee. And Sarah's like, 
what are you doing? Oh my god! And she realizes what's going on, and so I pull out the ring, and, and she's like, it's a very emotional moment for her. And uh, and there's, I tried to wait for there to be no people, but at this point, like I said, I couldn't walk it back. I was very tunnel vision. So apparently there were still people around us. And you could hear, like, people were like, like they couldn't figure out why, because she's you know she's emotional. She started to cry at this in this big moment, and all they could see is her crying and me kneeling in front of her. But they put my back to them, so they couldn't figure it out. And then eventually, and when I told Jim the story, he's like, "Yeah, it takes about five seconds for somebody to realize what's going on." I heard, "Oh, he's proposing." And then, so, like, Sarah's, like, nodding her head up and down through the, through the happy tears. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then I could hear, like, a really quiet, like, oh, yay. Like, they're, they're quietly applauding behind Aww. us. And I slipped the ring on, and she was so happy. She's like, it fits. <laughs> I did my homework. And so that was that. And then the only other funny little bit of that was uh, she tried calling family members. Uh, her mom was at the theater, and when she called her two brothers, they they you know they they're busy or away from their phone or whatever so she got a hold of her best friend first to to celebrate and then we went into Myers a uh, grocery store chain in the states and uh, we went in to go get champagne cuz in uh, the states you can buy alcohol in the the grocery stores so we go to get some champagne and some craft beers and stuff and so we're up at the front and they they have to check my ID so I give them my driver's license and I'm like yeah it's the the birthday underneath the picture and she's like oh your birthday's coming up and I'm like yeah we're from Canada and we're here for my dirty 30 birthday party so that's why we're here and Sarah's quiet she's like then we're getting married <laughs> she like just yells it at the the woman and the woman's like oh my god that's so amazing I'm going to cry for you so yes the best friend was the first one to find it and the woman at Myers was the second person to find it that's amazing so, so that was, and there was a lot of other f- really funny things around that weekend, but... Like the fact that you essentially began the, the formal proposal with the same sort of riddle contest that Bilbo Baggins used to stump Gollum? No. What has it got in its pockets? Its pockets. Mm-hmm. It's a ring. Like, that's, that's literally... It was the Ring of Power. It was, Arguably still is. Yeah. Um, so, yes, that was my best proposal story, because it was my proposal story. Um, yeah. How's that for an icebreaker? Well, that's your longest icebreaker <laughs> answer ever. <laughs> yeah. But perhaps worth it. So, I mean, engagement yeah. is a thing that um, you are now an expert on. Mm. And I, uh, I have a sample size of one. So. Well, I mean, you were arguably as expert as most people who get engaged. Mm -hmm. Like, um, lots of people do it for the second or third time. Mm -hmm. But um, lots of people do it for the first time. Mm -hmm. So you're you're, you're, you're as skilled. Now, I have never been engaged. Mm -hmm. Um, And we, we, but we wanted to talk about some of the sort of really neat things around it. And Mm -hmm. the best way we we figured to do this was um, in in reverse of our queerness podcast, where where I now is the, is the, the inexperienced one. Uh, guess what it is like, and then Ryan fills me in on the blanks because he is an actual real expert at this stuff because he's done it uh, in real life. I feel like we need at least one other person who's engaged <clears throat> and or married to help balance everything. Well, out. there isn't anybody else like that in this apartment, so yeah. I guess we're out of luck. <laughs> Start knocking on neighbors' doors. Yeah, great. <laughs> Do you want to be on our podcast? Okay, so sure <laughs> you can get evicted from a condo just by being an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so the decision. Yeah, I mean, this is then this is specifically the decision to like get engaged to a person, mm-hmm. and and what that means. Like, getting engaged means getting married, and getting married ostensibly means, you know, that the the whole like death do you part, eternal partnership, mm-hmm. everything goes along with that. Mm-hmm. Like that is that is very few people I think get engaged to be like, okay, we're gonna get married for like five years and then we're just gonna quit because mm-hmm. weddings are expensive. Yeah. I'm. I don't know how much ours is gonna be. It's only a week old, but we've already started looking at budget stuff, and yeah, it's gonna be a little pricey. <laughs> if I know one thing about weddings, they're expensive. Yeah, I have been in lots of them, yeah. and I've been to a bunch of them, and I've catered a few of them. They're expensive. I have been to a couple, and I have worked on the back end of the dishes side of a bunch of them. Yeah. So. I mean, but it's interesting to me, like, that decision is really interesting to me because I don't know that there's a clearer example 
in a human being's life when a whole bunch of tiny, tiny factors mm -hmm. lead up to a single decision where you can't necessarily put your finger on like one thing or two things it's it's a whole bunch of really tiny stuff like like lots of people will say well like this is the moment when i knew mm -hmm. that but but realistically that it, it's that moment and it's like a million other moments that reaffirmed that yes you know mm -hmm. um and that seems really cool and it seems like as soon as you make that decision like, like, even before getting a ring, as soon as you make the decision to get the ring, mm -hmm. to, to ask that question, um, everything from then on comes out of necessity. It's like, if, if you've ever... What I imagine it like is, have you ever had moments, and I assume that you have, because this is what I assume engagement is like, where you stop having confusion and start having clarity, like, all of a sudden on a particular issue... Well, I mean, that's what happened, in, or at least uh, I have that as part of the story for for when I decided to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, like, I, I don't have the date in front of me, but I could walk back the date. I know, like, I can nail down a specific day. It was a Friday in October. I just can't remember the specific date. There weren't very many of them. But, um, you know, there's, what, four of them. Um, it was a day I had, it was a Friday because I had taught that day. And I had a really, really bad headache. So I went home and I laid down for a nap. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, the only reason why it was important that I get rid of the headache is because I had to work at the bar that night. And so when I woke up from the nap, uh, and I remember like laying on the couch and I come to, and it wasn't like a dream thought, like a, a thought that carries over from when you were dreaming or something like that. It was mm -hmm. I woke up and the first thought I had in my mind is, I got to get a ring. Like it was, it was, there's no question about it. It was not like I before thought like, you know, like I would like to propose to Sarah at some point and I would, I, you know, like I would like to get a ring, but it's really expensive. Mm -hmm. In that moment I woke up and it was, I have to get a ring. My first solution, like the first way to uh, achieve that solution was I should text to get a family ring. Cause I know family members would be willing to, to pass along that like kind of family jewelry. And my first immediate reaction would have been like, just contact you know, mom, stepmom, and, yeah. get, and get a ring, like secure a ring on principle, mm -hmm. and do something about it, and and yeah, and it was it was just that sense of clarity that was there were there was it was a true sense of the decision. Like um, I, I'm borrowing this, uh, I, you know, I, I feel kind of goofy talking about it, but I, I listened to one of um, Tony Robbins's books. Um, I think it was the Awaken the Giant Within. And uh, the only reason, the only real lesson I extracted from it was when he talks about decision from a, a kind of etymological point of view. A decision, like to make a make a, a choice, a, a cut to exclude everything else. Like when you make a decision, you're not making a wish or you're not making a, a preference. He, he says when you make a decide and you you kind of commit to that decision, you're making one choice and everything, all other alternatives get excluded from that. They talk about the same thing in book five of Terry Goodkind's, um, I don't know, whatever the big giant book of semi-generic fantasy things that he wrote was. Oh, maybe Tony Robbins um, ripped that Sword off. Sword of Truth. Yeah, maybe, I don't know whoever, I'm assuming Tony Robbins. I don't know, I just remember them having like a big diatribe about how what war wizards do is decide, and when they decide, they cut, and that's... Yeah. Like well, it's the exact same rhetoric. Well, it's it's the it's, it's uh, like book four. Well, that's the, the war wizard. I, I think, think it's actually the, called the Latin, the, like the the actual translation from Latin. Yeah, and uh, but so he talks about it in this book, and that was the, one of the only concepts that really stuck with me when I was reading it. Is that concept of once you decide to go down a path, you're committing to that, and you're not like there's no kind of waffling on it. And so in that case, it was I woke up and I made a decision. I was going to do this wasn't gonna you know, it, it, it was going to happen I had to create a timeline for it mm -hmm. essentially and it you yeah know, and, make, and the neat thing about that to me like the, the really sort of fascinating thing about it to me is that we waffle on things all the time mm -hmm. like because the will is real you know we waffle on decisions we we make bad decisions that we reverse um, you know we we the, so the notion that, that this is one of those decisions where you know, like yes this is it I like everything is ready and everything else that happens 
either acts in service of this or doesn't. Mm -hmm. But it like it's it seems like that thing where it becomes the path of least resistance. Um and everything needs to just sort of go that direction, even if it doesn't turn out exactly the way you imagine. Mm -hmm. So I mean the lead up to that. I mean to your proposal story, like you, you plan you plan a trip to Michigan. Yeah, the you, you, you had I think it was a couple weeks ago we were here, like before the proposal mm -hmm. and you had this like whole plan. Mm -hmm. Um, because I couldn't convince you to propose on the podcast. Yeah, I know she wouldn't have gone for that. That seems fine. <laughs> Not fine um, at a base level. But um yeah, like, like it is interesting to me that like the, the, the level of planning that goes into that. And I think it's one of those things that's really different. I like it's if I were to to think about it in the abstract, it is the kind of thing where the process isn't so much like I need to have a lead up to a big proposal, but that this is a big deal and the most important thing I can do is understand my partner mm. and understand the way they would want me to ask them. Mm. Like like you you made a you made a thing out of it, um, not just for your own sense of drama, mm -hmm. but because your expectation is and your understanding of of, of her is such that you're like this is a thing she will really like. Like this is a like what we're what you're doing is creating a memory together mm -hmm. that you will have for the rest of your lives. Well, and it's not even just um, something that she would like. In some sense, it was something that was important to her. It's not important necessarily to everybody. Like you can have a like, hey, do you want to get married? Yeah, totally. Moment. But I know for, in Sarah's case, uh, that kind of gesture and and symbolism behind it was very important to her, which is mm -hmm. why it was important for me to, to do it in this way. Um, yeah, but like as opposed to like a Jumbotron ass. Yeah, like I know she didn't want a Jumbotron ass. She didn't want a ring in uh, the bottom of a champagne glass at a That's restaurant. Weird. Why would people do that? Hey, look, what a ring, you, accidentally. What if, you, yeah, but, but, but the, like... It's, it seems weird to me in the sense that the whole notion of this is that it is deli like like it is it is what I would what I would refer to as sort of deeply deliberate mm -hmm. like you you're you're making a decision like that and it, it is like whether you know whether it works out or not it is it is intensely deliberate mm -hmm. it is it can be nothing else but on purpose mm-hmm um, at least in the modern romantic sense, as opposed to the 15th century arranged marriage sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and and you you sort of went with that lead up that's that's gonna be mindful and and respectful mm -hmm. um, of there's that words, which is essentially what you do with partnership. Like that seems like exactly how that works. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's it's that whole we're going to communicate um, not through words but through memory. Yeah, like. We can, you know, you can have an entire conversation and come to an understanding without ever talking because you remember you, and you understand what the person is like. Mm -hmm. Well, there is there is that side of it, you know, um, knowing your partner and then executing a plan based on that knowledge. It's the whole other side of the actual rolling out of the plan. Not not the, like the, the proposal plan, but rolling it out. So, like... The logistics of securing a ring and the negotiations that go into it, which was is a story in and of itself, but that's not important for the podcast. The more f funny one, I guess, is um, I knew it was important to Sarah that I talk to her family and her best friend about it. <laughs> it was important that I talk to them. At mm -hmm. the very least, sound some ideas off them to make sure that I was indeed in the right ca category, because Sarah knows that... You know, like, my ideas of romance and some of that are sometimes different than hers. And so we, I needed to make sure that I was getting it right with her. The catch, though, is Sarah, at present, and for the last eight months, has been working with her family day in and day out at the business. And I knew that I had to strategically inform people, lest they spill the beans. Yeah. And so, like, I tried to talk to her mom in person... And it was just a kind of misconnection thing. I didn't physically see her on the trip that I made up <laughs> to Newmarket to see her. So I, I had to talk to her over the phone, the, uh, you know, the next day kind of deal, which was about a week before it happened. Um, 
and same with the best friend like the best friend lives in Toronto I could not physically get out to see her um, here was the funny thing was I wanted to tell her oldest brother that you know like I was planning on on, on proposing um, and I, we were out at dinner this was about a week before we were out at dinner and I figured okay maybe when Sarah goes to the washroom or something I'll find a way to so like, like, re- really like refilling her water and refilling it again like I'm imagining some elaborate cloak and dagger shit here to get, to get man. Sarah away from the table um, I Aren't figured, you just like making waterfall sounds <laughs> Well, and I realize in retrospect it wouldn't have worked because for to to well, I don't rely, know what sounds like. yeah, to rely on them to be able to contain their excitement in that moment wouldn't have been a good idea. They would have been really weird. Um, but I was going. I, I thought maybe I could tell them at this dinner. And throughout the conversation, like in the middle of the conversation, uh, it just naturally came up the idea of Sarah and I getting married. And the brother was having dinner with us. And he got red in the face and started to get a little watery-eyed at the thought of his baby sister getting married. And all I could think of was, I can't tell him because he's going to ruin it. He's going me. to blow the secret. Well, he's going to blow my cover. He can't, he can't take it. It's, he can't handle the truth. It's not the first time it happened. The first time, <laughs> the first time it almost blew up in my face was Oktoberfest. So like this is to give you a sense of, in October... Uh, by Oktoberfest, this is the fest I had, that, that month celebrates. Yeah, yes. but I had made a decision. So I, my grandmother came up for the Oktoberfest celebrations, and uh, I was walking her back to the car, uh, and she was, you know, like, "Oh, Ryan, you can't wait. Like, you should, you should really propose." Sarah's <laughs> Even your grandma's girl. like, "Get on that, man." Yeah, grandma was on it, and so I'm like, "Okay, I can tell her." So I'm like, "You know, Bubby, don't tell anybody." But today I put a down deposit on the ring. Oh, she was so happy, right? And then when she went to go say goodbye to Sarah, she's like hugging her and kissing her on the cheek. And Sarah was like, what is wrong with your Bubby? Like, she, Sarah's under the misunderstanding that Bubby for some reason hates her. I don't know where this comes from, but it's one of those things that she just assumes her, my grandmother doesn't like her. But um, but Bubby was like super, super happy and effusive. And even Sarah was like, what? And all I'm thinking is like, don't blow it, Bobby. Don't blow it. Don't blow it for me. Don't, do not ruin this secret for me. So, Grandma almost blew it. I couldn't tell the brother because he would have blown it. I told the mother the week before because I didn't want her to inadvertently spill the beans. Like, it was just one of those things. Like, the the control and just, containment. Like, this is a true, like, containment you just, like, of... You just, like, call with, like, a voice changer... Someone's going to propose to your daughter. It, you someone, almost, you almost have to. Someone with a beard. Someone, someone who's very tall and wide. Who, who is this? This message will self-destruct. <laughs> like I'm just saying, if the if the United States government couldn't keep Watergate. <laughs> The Watergate scandal is secret with all of its power. How is I going to maintain this conspiracy? Like, there's no way little old me with my piddly little resources and inability to think on the fly. I am a terrible Dungeons and Dragons player. I cannot See, vamp dude, for the life of me. Dude, I offered. I offered. I was like, I'll go to Frankenmuth with you and we'll Cyrano to Bergerac that shit. Yeah, I don't think that would have worked. No, probably not. That would have been a dramatically awful experience, but it would have been even more memorable. Although I guess you wouldn't really be remembering it like when you're watching this video 50 years from now and laughing yeah. about it. Um, you'd be like, nope. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, when you're talking about just the lead so, like there's the decision where you, you finally decide to act. Then there is the, all of the logistics that go into making it happen, plus that idea of finally, you know, like making that kind that, of commitment. Like that, and, the, the, the ask. I mean, yeah. like because the commitment thing, I think, comes from the decision. Yeah. Like that's 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 the decision bit where you're like, no, no, no. This is like this is this is not tomorrow. This is all tomorrows. No. And. Yeah, I mean the ask, like like it's in, the the ask seems almost trivial at that point. Yeah. Like I, I in 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 my in the icebreaker I talked about you know admittedly in a story the notion of um uh the the, the you know do you want to get married or what and and just the, the the ask is the throwaway bit because like the answer has been clear for a long time. The ask is just the catalyst that that creates the opportunity for that answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's really weird to me in 
in movies, um, like romantic comedies and shit like that, because they spend so much on the ask. Because I mean, you can't really show the lead up. You can't really well. You can't really show the decision. Mm -hmm. And all of the things that lead into the decision. You can, but it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and the, 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 the ask is the big thing. It's like, it's like where, all the, where all the stakes are. And I'm like, no, the stakes are in the decision. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the scary bit. Mm -hmm. The ask. Um, like, you mentioned being nervous. And, and, I, and I guess I get that. But it seems like the kind of thing where, like, once you're there in the moment, you know, you weren't, you, there, there was no possible world in which you just left that box in your pocket. Yeah. There was no, there was no moment, like, like you knew that it was going to happen that night, uh, barring, like, barring some kind of, you know, uh, intense intervention. Mm-hmm. Um, and so with that in mind, like, like it's the, the, the ask is necessity. The ask is, is not something that might happen. It's something that needs to happen mm -hmm. and things that need to happen are going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't make sense to be nervous about them, which doesn't, I mean, preclude people from being nervous about them, but it, it's it, like, yeah, it seems like the, the low stakes bit of it. Yeah. Because the, before you even say the words. Like the words, the words don't even matter, because the the act of getting down on one knee mm -hmm. says those words. Mm -hmm. The act of pulling out a ring says those words. the The words bit is completely irrelevant. Yeah. Like every motion of that is the ask. Mm -hmm. And like I don't know, it's poetry. <laughs> Like it's it is it's 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 conveying meaning it's conveying meaning um, without using words. Yeah. Like it's it's can it's conveying meaning without without you know using conven or using convention. Um, I have known people who who would do it as like a joke, mm -hmm. like they will like get down on one knee in a public place, um, because they're assholes. But uh, like the notion that. Um, when someone gets down on one knee in front of their partner, it immediately means things. Not just to you, you know, like not just to you and your partner, but to everyone around you who partakes in human experience. Mm -hmm. Like space aliens would watch that and be like, "Well, what's going on there?" Except they probably wouldn't talk like that. But, but you know, you mentioned like like the human beings around you took took a couple of seconds to figure out. You know, when they're like, "Oh, that's weird." To because there's that moment of, oh, that person's crying, and that person is consoling them? What's going on there? And then you're like, you're, you're, the rest of your brain catches up with you, and you're like, oh! Mm. And the only way you can do that is you're, you're communicating it to all these people through the, like, just motions and, and, and movement. Like, it's the interpretive dance of engagement. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, I mean, the ask... Seems almost unnecessary. Yeah. Like you, 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 you do it without saying the words. Like you say the words because they matter. Mm -hmm. um, but what communicates the intent is that is that movement. Mm -hmm. Like I think that's 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 why I find "Do you want to get married or what?" so striking <laughs> is that it doesn't have any of that. It's it's the notion that even that movement is unnecessary. We understand each other well enough that. A throwaway, the, the, this throwaway remark, um, like the, the the notion of all future tomorrows is so obvious that, it, that the ask is a throwaway remark, mm -hmm. um, which I understand is deeply romantic. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think spoilers. Jim is a poet. Spoilers. Yeah. Jim is a romantic. No, it it definitely was like it was it was nerve wracking only in so far as like, there was never there was never a serious moment where I thought she was gonna say no, um, other than kind of like a capricious thing where she's so overloaded by the moment that it's like like it's kind of like a rejection push away, but not because 
you know, she doesn't accept it, but because she's just overwhelmed by the decision or overwhelmed by the moment. Um, so that, now if that had happened, you would have had to like learn the powers of the dark side and walk the path of the Sith. Uh, may, maybe something like that. You can't be a Sith and be on this podcast. <laughs> we got uh, a room. No. So, I mean, there was no real moment where it was, uh, a doubt of what, what was so nerve wracking was if this is the only time I'm going to be doing this and asking this question, Am I am I creating the the right? It's not even creating the right memory, but it's making it sufficiently magical that mm. it's something. It's it's a it's a story worth telling. And in some yeah. sense, because it didn't go according to plan, that's what makes it even more special. Because it is entirely in line with you know Sarah's and my relationship, like bumbling idiot Ryan. <laughs> doing stupid stuff right so i think that was the more nerve-wracking is kind of like did i did i gather enough experience to level up <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i think like so so any any wizard with their salt will tell you that i mean even the most casual things are the most magical mm. right? I, 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 like i get it, it ceremony is a way of making something magic but it isn't the only way mm. um i mean that is that is the notion that there is magic locked up in everything that you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sneaking um, magic into the mundane. Yeah, who is it? T.H. Uh, White. Of course, <laughs> thinking about T.H. White's uh, wizards, Merlin in particular, I remember from Once in Future King, the, the the line he told Arthur, he's like, Arthur's like, what do you mean you, you, you remember the future? Merlin's like, yup. And he's like, well, what, what happens to you in the future? He's like, I roll, I, I, I wind up spending eternity in a cave because um, the witch Nimue uh, rolls a big rock in front of it, like lures me inside and rolls a big rock in front of it and I can't get out. And Arthur's like, well, you know that. Why would you do that? And he's like, well, I'm going to be in love at the time and people in love can do foolish things. <laughs> I don't know. I, I Shockingly, like... Um, I, I enjoy linking romance and magic because it's really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and the sort of like conceptual wizardry that goes along with it. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so the end of season three, the end of 2016, um, and the beginning of bold new futures. Yeah. Um, braver ones, more vital ones, and uh, lots of fun to come in the next season. Yeah, and then yeah, spending next year planning out a wedding. Uh, we're going to go with 2018, mm. prob- probably about summer-ish. We haven't really booked a venue, so the date's not firm. But well, there is one bit of business that I need to resolve. Jim, would you what? do me the honor of being my best man? Um, yes, I would be honored. Yes. I've even best man for Orion before. There you go. So he's already had at least one successful run through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, as far as I know, basically all Ryans are the same. <laughs> Thank you very much. There we go. We are ending off 2016 with a, not a wedding, but an engagement. <laughs> it's super Shakespearean. Super Shakespearean. But nobody died. Nobody died. Everybody lives just this once. <laughs> anyway, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And we're signing off. Have a happy new year, and we'll see you next year. Stay awesome. The the name of the store, I know, well, I don't even remember where. It's a Hot Topic. You were no. describing a Hot Topic right now. I, it wasn't a Hot Topic. Like, it wasn't a Hot Topic or HMV, but it might as well have been. It, it had a different name. What's an HMV? They used to sell music, but now they sell everything else what? as well. How would you sell music in a storefront? Very carefully. Where do you not, download it on? Not, not very effective.